In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning to you all. Our text this morning is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 14 and going through to verse 21, on the theme of a new creation. Now, whenever one encounters a Pauline text, one knows that things can go in a variety of directions, uh, because Paul's writings are so uh, complex and still controversial, and almost anything he says is attached to a huge variety of often contradictory interpretations. So given this, I intend to confine myself to probing a single statement in today's text, in order for us to grapple together with the topic we've been given, a new creation. And the verse I want to explore is verse 15. Those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now I have to give a bit of background first. This idea comes from Paul's sense of having been called. He began his first uh, letter to the Corinthians, for example, by identifying himself as Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The Greek term is kletos, which is in the same word group as ecclesia, Paul's term for church or congregation, uh, which means those who are called out. And the point I'm making is that all believers share Paul's apostolic calling. And so the initial point I want to underline is that to be called is already to be a new creation because we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. By definition, every Christian is a new creation. And I'll be asking what this means for our Christian walk. Uh, Paul's sense was that he'd been called by the Messiah to live within a new understanding of time, messianic time which one scholar defines as contracted time. That is, the present time between Jesus' resurrection and parousia, which is usually taken to refer to his second coming, when things matter more urgently and deeply than ever. And I want to identify four features of this messianic time. One, uh, worldly categories should no longer give us our sense of worth. Two, we live in the new realm of resurrection, but death is still present in various guises. Three, we live in a new mode of time, characterized by urgency, because God is doing something new. And four, we have the task of reconciliation. Now, this may all seem self-evident, but I think the scholar is correct, who has argued that the church has buried the messianic element in Paul's thinking in favor of concentrating on his apparent rejection of the Jewish law which has allowed us to use Paul as a battering ram to knock down the Jewish faith and pat ourselves on the back that we alone are truly spiritual. In short, the accusation is that the church has domesticated Paul, an accus accusation we should take seriously, in my opinion. So, let's get back to the radical Paul, who calls us to share his calling to live messianically. And I take each uh, of the four features of messianic time I listed in, in turn, beginning with the loss of our identity through worldly categories. Now this is a central theme in Romans and Galatians, but one reference will be enough for us today. In Galatians 3.28, Paul says, There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female. In other words, categories that have divided people uh, and identified people should not do so in the time of the Messiah. Remember, Paul spoke into a world in which the division between Jew and Greek was sharply marked by custom, especially by circumcision and the Torah, and an attitude of mutual distaste. As Messianic people, Paul says, your identity is no longer either Jew or Greek. All that matters is that you belong to the Messiah. Translated into our world, whether we are British or American, rich or poor, educated or not, black or white-skinned, Western or Eastern, Chinese, Arab, African or European, and so on. None of these categories should mark the way we understand ourselves and value ourselves. What matters is to be in Christ. That is our new identity. And because Christ was human, through him 
we are one humanity. The second feature of Messianic time is that it is the time of resurrection when the meaning and significance of death has changed. We share in the Messiah's resurrection life by also sharing in his death, which means we must die to self, which is why Paul says we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. But no longer living for ourselves uh, doesn't just mean being unselfish in our attitude uh, to others. More radically, it means taking our hands off ownership of things in the world. We are owned by God through Christ, and it is this calling that we are to own nothing else. And this, I think, is probably the most radical challenge of spiritual life. Paul emphasizes living by faith and not by law, for example, not because of any deficiency in the Jewish law, but because law, uh, by its nature, operates by instituting divisions and separations. The Greek for law is nomos, which derives from nemo, to divide. So we become attached to where these divisions place us in the world, and they come to own us. A messianic, a messianic calling, by contrast, requires us to use the things of the world we live in, but not be possessed by them. That's why Paul tells people that whether you are circumcised or not, whether you're a slave or free, whether you're married or not, whether you are male or female, these categories should not define you. They are all human realities, of course, that we have to take seriously. But as those who have been called by the Messiah, they should never possess or define us. We are to use what is given us in the world appropriately, but not allow any of it to define us or own us. And that's a challenge, to put it mildly. The third feature of Messianic time is that it is time as crisis. Now, the coronavirus has given us a taste of time as crisis, hasn't it? A time when what we've known as normal life stops and we are forced to re-evaluate our lives. There are signs that this re-evaluation may bring positive results, but still, crisis brings a longing for an end. And though the reason for our longing for an end is different from Paul's, the longing is similar. In Paul's thought, this end would be brought about by the parousia. However, the meaning of this term is quite difficult, and I want to suggest a different way to think of it. In the church's teaching commonly, the parousia refers to the second coming of Jesus, which it is thought will bring the world to a halt as we know it. But the philosopher Giorgio Agamben, in his fascinating study of Romans, has argued convincingly that this is incorrect, because parousia doesn't mean a second coming, but a being alongside, which is the literal meaning of parousia. If Agamben is right, and I think he is, the end Paul expected wasn't that the world would suddenly stop, but that the being present of the risen Christ would bring the way the world commonly works to an end. The time of the Messiah would bring about a messianic way of life in the world. That was Paul's hope, and it should be our hope and focus as well. This is what Paul means when he says, the old has uh, gone, the new is here in verse 17. The point about living in messianic time is that it makes time constantly significant. Time is kairos, the Greek word for the time of God's action, not mere chronos, the Greek word for time as just one thing after another. This is why we are to attach ourselves to nothing in the world, though we use what is there. We are called to live in kairos time, giving ourselves completely to God's action in the world. Paul expects the parousia at any and every moment, because it represents the presence in the world of the resurrected Christ. And so he expects an end to what has been normal. Uh, not as a one-time event, though it sounds like that, but as a constant of our experience of life. Our messianic calling, then, is to make the beauty of eternity visible now, even though it will be a mere glimpse, because, as Paul said in another place, we still see through a glass darkly. The parousia has arrived, and yet is still to come. And that's because kairos time occurs within chronos time. Life continues, but its character is different. I come now to the fourth feature of our messianic uh, 
calling the Ministry of Reconciliation. Now, much Christian teaching of Paul has underplayed the central place he gives reconciliation in favour of a focus on the propitiation or expiation of our sins. And that's because modern Western individualism has been the lens through which we read Paul. And those concepts fit the idea of uh, that salvation is about getting individuals into heaven. However, Paul always speaks to communities and seeks to build messianic communities characterized by those who no longer live for themselves, but for reconciliation, which is a social teaching primarily, meaning the exchange of a hostile relationship for a friendly one, and beginning, as Paul makes clear in verse 20, with our reconciliation with God. Notice how Paul emphasizes reconciliation in our short passage. The word itself occurs four times in three verses, and Paul makes it the critical way we show that we are Christ's ambassadors, which is how he describes us in verse 20. Reconciliation is so centrally important because God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Christ's work, in other words, is our work also. For Jacob Taube is a Jewish philosopher who's written an important book about Paul. Paul's messianism is significant in undermining social hierarchies that divide human beings from one another, making hostility and conflict fundamental to social life. By contrast, in Paul's teaching, messianic communities are to be characterized by reconciliation, which in his letters meant tackling divisive issues in local churches, among other things. Messianic time and its call to live in Christ gives us at least these four ways to think about and measure Paul's ringing statement at verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has done the work of renewal, we just have to show that we are part of that work. The coronavirus has, as I've said, given us an experience of normal time being radically interrupted. We've experienced the way this makes us all individually and as a society, take stock of what's important in our lives. As the Messiah's people, the shock of this interrupted period can be used positively for us to take stock of our values, practices and commitments. Do we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again? Amen.